Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is fascinating to me as an historical example of engineered legend. I mean, Horian Gracie is a genius. He and the other executives who were his friends at Semaphore Entertainment in 1993 created this big infomercial for Gracie Jiu Jitsu. It was it was brilliant. It was it was sheer genius, and he deserves some kind of award for it, which I guess he's gotten because you know the guy's pretty wealthy now. I mean, he set up a contest where the rules favored his particular martial art. He handpicked, you know, the right brother who was the least intimidating. I mean, if they'd put Hickson in there, he would have he would have done what Kimura did to to his grandfather. He would have given the man involuntary chiropractic care. Elio Gracie, he claimed on record that he was undefeated. You see the problem there. So Masahiko Kimura, arguably the greatest judoka who ever lived, they call him the god of judo, basically turned that man into a pretzel. He gave him a spiral fracture in his arm and ripped it out of the socket, essentially. Elio Gracie was basically handled like a like a bear attacking a salmon, and yet he claimed to have never lost. And when they further interrogated this, he said, well, I never gave up, therefore I never lost. Suddenly this changes the entire rhetoric of the story, right? But also that they invited very select martial artists to participate, all but one of whom didn't have the background to defend against a grappler like that. You notice there were no, there were no Olympic level judo people in the early UFCs. Isn't that a little curious, right? How would things have been different if there were a, if there were a gold medalist judo player in the first UFC? Yeah, that's not the same outcome. The fact that Ken Shamrock had the right training was sheer happenstance of history, only because the Gracies, they weren't clued into just how much grappling he'd been doing. So that's interesting. And then the stories about the early UFCs continue to become legend over time. Tay Latuli, right? The sumo wrestler. He's a sumo wrestler only insofar as he said he was a sumo wrestler. That man didn't train in Japan. Sumo wrestlers as a group are the strongest combat athletes in the world. People joke about them being fat. Most of that's not fat, people. Meet a real sumo wrestler in real life and they are disturbingly powerful. I mean, it they're carrying so much muscle that people sometimes ask why they don't move into American football if they're so strong. Well, that's that's like taking uh, George St. Pierre and having him play soccer. Like, it's, it's not the same contest. These men are built for nothing but sheer raw power in a very short span of time. In fact, uh, the, the early martial arts researcher, Don Drager, had a very wry statement he would make to people sometimes. If your martial art is so supernaturally powerful, you should compete in professional sumo because you can make so much money doing it. And yet no one was able to take him up on the offer. So as far as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu goes, it's just judo. I mean, it's a different rule set now and so they've they've been able to modify techniques because any given sport is really just an exercise of the human mind to adapt to a very narrow rule set it's not about who's the best fighter in any contest it's about who's the best fighter in this very particular category and so brazilian jiu-jitsu was brilliantly used as a commercial i mean the, the ufc was used as a commercial for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in that way. And then to put the Gracie branding name on it was the cherry on top. It's just such a good idea. Imagine if Masoyama had somehow gotten everyone in the world to think that the only karate is Masoyama karate. And so everybody had to stick with that brand. Such a good move. I also heard recently that there is a very well-researched documentary about the history of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coming out, I believe it's next year. This one is not associated with the Gracie family, and so it's going to go into the, the more murky depths of the real history. You know, the Gracies, the story is that the mysterious judo or Jiu-Jitsu master, who they didn't even want to name for a long time, comes to Brazil and because the, the Gracie patriarch helped him to get established that he taught his sons jujitsu. 
which is a great, clean, wonderful little origin story, very little of which is true. In fact, the Gracies were circus people, professional promoters, among other things. Having access to this Japanese judo teacher, Maeda is an interesting character in, in his own right. People call him, uh, what, what, what's that Brazilian nickname they gave him as a wrestler? Conde Coma, Count Combat in Portuguese, I think. So he was a pro wrestler and he had that nickname. But in his own in his own diary and correspondence, he referred to himself as like Komateru Maeda, I think was the term, troubled Maeda. Because his entire thing was that he came to the US to teach judo, specifically to politicians. And in the in the adventure that was his young life, he ends up in Brazil without enough money just to get back to Japan. And even if he did get back to Japan, he would have had problems because there were rules instated at the Kodokan that you can't make money from professional wrestling if you are a judo exponent. So Kano had a problem with professional wrestling because he was trying to distance his invention of judo from what he perceived to be very low-brow, low-class, like showy, violent, martial entertainment and so he said okay i'm gonna you know judo we're gonna have a rule at my school that you cannot be involved in that stuff because at that point in history japanese jujitsu was dying like nobody wanted to learn it and so one of the few ways to make money off of it and this is true of of the weapons-based martial arts too was to put on public demonstrations essentially early early combat sports it, it became even more unsavory Around the 1920s and 1930s in Japan, they started to experience the most interesting mixed martial arts, wherein uh, Western sailors, especially, who boxing and wrestling are very popular among Western military men at this point, uh, they would arrive in port cities like Yokohama. Now, this is before Japan is gearing up for World War II, so they're still allowing Westerners into the country with some, some amount of freedom. And so there were all these cross matches where Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Judo practitioners would engage in, in weird fights with Westerners using different rule sets and one guy's wearing a Judo uniform and one guy has boxing gloves and it, it was all very messy. But that stuff was going on well before World War II. So to try to distance Judo as a, as a brand from all of that business, Kano just said, you can't be involved in combat sports, it's not a thing. Kano didn't even want judo to be in the Olympics. So the fact that it is and it became a sport, he would not be happy with the current state of judo. 